field gravitation is synonymous with space time geometry and mathematically characterized by the curvature or distortion of space time gravity is described by einstein's equations which are a complicated 10 coupled nonlinear partial differential equations general relativity has had far reaching impact for example it can be applied to the universe as a whole leading to modern cosmology which deals with the origin evolution and end of the universe it predicts extreme warping of space time the existence of neutron stars and black holes and finally the prediction of gravitational waves which has been crowned by the first detections if the first one has led to precision cosmology with the observation of the cosmic microwave background the second to relativistic astrophysics with the observations of pulsars quasars and x-ray sources the last really heralds the dawn of a new and transformative astronomy a year after he came with the general theory of relativity einstein used linearized gravity and proposed the existence of gravitational waves as one of the important consequences a couple of years later he calculated the flux of energy from a source this is his famous quadrupole formula and in analogy to electromagnetism talked about radiation reaction or radiation damping however in 1922 eddington pointed out that einstein's derivation really will not apply to self gravitating systems he also realized that in general relativity issues of gauge could be subtle and quipped that gravity waves seem to propagate at the speed of thought these subtleties continue to vex even einstein for in 1936 he wrote to born together with a young collaborator i arrived at the interesting result that gravity waves do not exist however before the paper was published in an obscure journal of the franklin society he was convinced about his erroneous interpretation and he retracted that in the paper basically writing to the editor that fundamental changes in the paper were required because consequences of the equations derived in the paper had previously been incorrectly inferred that means gravitational waves don't exist if you want to calculate corrections to newtonian theory then you use something called the post newtonian approximation and this was also started by people like einstein drost and dirichlet if you really look at this approximation you realize that it involves three different approx uh, approximations or expansions a weak field expansion a slow motion expansion and a near zone expansion when you are dealing with radiation however if you try to calculate even the leading correction when the bodies are extended it is a fairly complicated problem and it had a lot of difficulties because how to treat the internal structures of bodies is a complex problem and it is only in 1938 in the work of einstein infeld and hoffman that this n body problem reached its first stage of maturity and textbooks of hawk landau lipschitz essentially discuss this what is the problem uh, the complication for self self gravitating system for a self gravitating system the orders in velocity are related to orders in nonlinearity because by the virial theorem the potential associated with that body is of the same order as v square so if in a linear theory you add reaction terms of order v by c raised to 5 in this in the presence of self gravity you would have terms like v by c cube into 5 by c square or v by c into 5 square so if you want to do a higher order post newtonian calculation you have to face the nonlinearities of einstein's equation and this was basically done by landau lipschitz and fock who extended the quadrupole formula to include self gravitating systems and even today these two treatments are the two different approaches to calculating higher order gravity wave generation in the period after that there seem to be many inconsistent results and if we look at them why they were there in, during those times you realize that either they are related to the distinction you know the difficulty to distinguish between coordinate singularities and physical singularities how do you use in a nonlinear theory retarded solutions or advanced potentials or do you use a combination of them in a post newtonian scheme how do you impose a known radiate no radiation in coming boundary condition so these kinds of issues really lead led to a lot of confusion in the theory of gravitational waves and therefore in 1960 chandrashekhar decided to look at this problem by himself and he asked the question how does the emission of gravitation wave effect if a system is self gravitating he was the first to show conceptually that radiation reaction problem could be solved for a fluid kind of system 
he assembled together the essential ingredients which involved taking care of the nonlinearities of the gravitational field, use of retarded potential, making a near zone expansion to match to the source, and putting all these things together, he got the first result for gravitation emission. And this result basically gave astrophysicists confidence that GR was really physically reasonable, well behaved, and if you if the system emitted energy and angular momentum, that was correctly balanced by the loss in mechanical energy and angular momentum of this particular system. A year after Einstein's theory, the Schwarzschild solution, which is the first exact solution, was really given. But until 1960, the nature of what people call the Schwarzschild singularity was not clear. It's only in the later work of people like Finkelstein and Kruskal and the introduction of global methods by Penrose and Hawking that the notion of an event horizon and therefore the understanding of what we call today as a Schwarzschild black hole really came into being. In 1963, the rotating black hole solution was given by Kerr. So these were the main characters under and this, in whose work we understand gravitation and uh, you know, general relativity and black holes. And then, once the basic program began, people started studying perturbations of black holes, and this work was started by the work of Wheeler, Reje, Tchaikovsky. And in 1970, Vishweshara, many of us who know him here, basically looked at the linear stability of the Schwarzschild black hole and was showed for the first time that black holes emit something called quasi-normal modes, finally when they ring down and they settle to a stationary state. By looking at the effective potential around black holes, one could uh, talk about things which we use today, the notion of an innermost stable circular orbit at a certain value of outside the uh, black hole, or the existence of a photon ring or a light ring at r equal to 3m. So these were the uh, progress which happened in analytical relativity. But then the question is, what about, how do you talk about the physical effects of gravitational waves? And what, how do you measure them if they are there? The two names which come to one's mind is Felix Pirani and Herman Bondi. And in 1957, there was a conference in gravitation on physics at Chapel Hill. And in this conference, one can say that the gravity wave problem was solved and the quest for gravity wave detection essentially born. Pirani basically said that though the generation of gravitational wave is complex, what we should focus on is to analyze the effect of gravitational waves and argued that the effect of gravitational waves are unambiguously determined by the equation of geodesic deviation. In the presence of gravitational wave, if you have a set of freely falling masses, they would experience genuine motion relative to each other and therefore gravitational waves are not just coordinate effects but they are real. So Bondi asked, can you connect the two masses with a dash spot absorbing energy from the wave? And Pirani replied, I have not put in an absor absorption term, but only put in a spring. You can invent a system with such a uh, term quickly. So then we, this is what really led to the sticky bead argument, where you basically have a rod, two gaskets sn sitting snugly on it. And if there is tidal motion because of gravitational waves, these rods, these rings will move. And because of friction, they will heat. And therefore, because you could heat a system by using gravitational waves, obviously it is a physical effect. So, though you can make gravitational waves do many things by change of coordinates, the way they interact with matter must always make sense physically. And what is shown here is that if you had a ring of particles and a gravitational wave falls on them, they would be squeezed in a time-dependent manner. And therefore, the squeezing is a signature of what happens. In mathematical relativity also, people studied the uh, gravitational waves by using asymptotics correctly and by looking at the wild tensor, again people showed that you could uh, talk about an invariant characterization of gravitational waves in, in an arbitrary sort of space time. In this meeting, Weber and Wheeler were there. Then this led Weber to the idea that maybe you can build a gravity wave detector and that is what we call as a bar detector today. It is important to realize that Weber had confidence in the physicality of gravitational waves. He started gravity wave detection when, we, when the theory itself was in a big disarray and was in some sense disabling. 
1969, after building his detector, he made the first claim of gravitational wave detection. Unfortunately, when other groups tried to re repeat this particular result, they could not repeat it. And this was one of the tragic, you know, kind of uh, negative results in the field, something which we had to uh, overcome over the years. The next important point is in 1963, where in Soviet Union, these two physicists basically said that you can use laser interferometry to detect gravitational waves. But it was in the work of Ray Weiss in MIT, who when teaching a course on GR basically asked, what is it really, what is really measurable in general relativity? And he again goes back to Pirani, who had not actually used a spring or a dashboard, but said, it is assumed by an observer that by use of light signals or otherwise, you, he can determine the coordinates of neighboring particle in his local Cartesian coordinate system. So you can use light to determine where the particles are, and therefore you could use it to determine the effect of gravitational waves. And brooding over it over many years, he basically sets it as a homework problem for his students, and this essentially led to LIGO. So if you have a gravitational wave from a binary system in the nearest cluster of galaxies, it causes a small displacement, one thousandth of a Fermi, and if you can measure the small displacement, then you can detect gravitational waves. As the heterogeneous of science basically mentioned, gravity wave detection is about seeing the biggest things that ever happen by measuring the smallest changes that have ever been measured. So this is Ray Weiss when he began his career, and this is Ray Weiss energetic as always, but as he is today, Kip Thorne when he began in Caltech, and Ron Dreber who brought in many techniques from optics into gravity wave detection. The third track is the discovery of the binary pulsar, which is high quality data that gravitational waves must exist. In 1974, Hulse and Taylor discovered this binary pulsar 1913 plus 16. If general relativity is the right theory, the system must emit gravitational waves and in spiral inwards. If you observe the system for about 30 years, you basically see that the orbital period changes exactly as predicted by Einstein's theory, and this is proof that gravitational waves are real and have real physical effects. The moment this observation came about, all the fluff around the theoretical discrepancies went away. The prospects of testing post-Newtonian theory against the system led people to look more critically at the existing derivation, at the existing approximation schemes, and led to the scheme which we use today to calculate gravitational waves, a scheme which is called the multipolar post-Minkowskian, post-Newtonian scheme. And using this, you can improve on Einstein's calculation and calculate what will be the radiation reaction if a system emits gravitational waves. The binary pulsar gave us many insights. It basically gave us observational proof that gravity propagates at the speed of light, has a quadrupolar structure. But importantly, it basically told us that there exist neutron star binaries which emit gravitational waves for millions of years, and then they will coalesce spectacularly in the sensitivity bandwidth of the detector. And that brings me to the last phase, that is towards the experiment to directly detect gravitational waves. The late in spiral and merger epochs of compact binaries of neutron stars and black holes, these provide strong sources of gravitational waves for these detectors in a frequency band which we call high frequency band. These systems are highly relativistic at this particular point, so we have guaranteed sources if, we, if there are enough of them put out by astrophysics, if you look at the waveform, simple physical arguments tell us that their amplitude and frequency increases with time, so we have to we will look for a chirp waveform. But if you really look at the numbers, it turns out that even these strongly gravitating sources produce weak signals compared to the noise of the detector, which is very large. So unless you use engineering techniques like match filtering, you cannot detect them or characterize these particular signals. But if you want to use match filtering, you need to predict these signals very accurately using general theory of relativity. That is why our favorite sources are coalescing compact binaries made up of neutron stars or black holes. And this is where the Indian legacy in gravity wave research really lies. Starting from 1990, there has been an activity on gravity wave data analysis under my distinguished colleague Durandar at Ayuka and at RRI, of work on source modeling in a group around me. But when LIGO was funded in the early 90s, it was realized that because you are looking at coalescing compact binaries, 
you really need to go much beyond what you knew for the binary pulsar because the system is very very relativistic you could not do numerical relativity so you really had to appeal to physical insights and put in together the physical insights like the fact that they move eventually in quasi circular orbits since you want to do mesh filtering you have to model the phase much more accurately you can work in the adiabatic approximation initially and instead of talking about an in spiral talk about moving from one circular orbit to another you can try to model these particles as delta functions rather you know you are talking about black holes but you model them as point particles you use some technical things related to regularization to go around uh, difficulties which you reach here and as i told you you have this uh, mechanism which was invented or this approximation which was invented for binary pulsar analysis you could generalize it and therefore you find that over the next 20 years it was this experiment which drove the theory you took in, into account all the non linear effects which come in in the general theory of relativity and finally come to a conclusion of how much gravity wave is emitted in the coalescing phase what is the correction to the quadrupole formula which is just this leading term and you calculate it to v7 by c7 beyond the leading order so the whole question is this is only the in spiral state what will happen in the merger what will happen after the merger this was the basic question which people like kipthorn had but then people showed that starting from the post newtonian calculation knowing what we know from perturbation theory you can use something which is called as the effective one body theory and even calculate what happens during the merger phase so you essentially replace this two body problem by a problem where you have an effective metric in which a uh, test particle sort of moves and by using this what people showed is that the merger phase is a very smooth continuation of the in spiral phase it is very short lived and then finally it is matched on by the you know ring down of the black hole which is described by quasi normal mode fortunately what happened is that in 2005 numerical relativity also for the first time in this work of pretorius produced a first simulation where a large number of orbits could be actually calculated again it used many uh, techniques from mathematical relativity it was a non standard method but once this result came about in the next couple of years using standard methods people could again you know calculate the in spiral the merger phase by using numerical relativity and with this particular breakthrough we are in a situation where we can try to match what comes from numerical relativity with the post newtonian calculation and they are in very good agreement so we have an exclusive theory where the earlier part is described by post newtonian theory then there is numerical relativity and then there is perturbation theory which i told you in the beginning so all these uh, uh, theoretical developments come together and underlie the analysis which we do in the binary pulsar i also sort of told you that once you had these waveform models you can use them to construct template banks so that you can cover the parameter space which you want to explore which includes all the masses and spins and etc and this particular work as i told you involves many different aspects and the group at ayuka and around sanjeev durandar made many seminal contributions to this particular work and of course the unforgiving experiment about which only we will basically talk to you about so at last with advanced ligo we achieved the technology to make a direct detection of gravitational waves 100 years after einstein predicted them we also have the corresponding problem uh, progress in the two body problem so that we can detect the gravitational waves characterize them and begin to test general theory of relativity so from the neutron star binaries which we used to justify our proposal to the discovery of the binary black holes which happened in the first detection one can be left speculating about what will eventually happen finally so we can say that february 11 2016 was essentially the 1919 of our generation and i don't think einstein would have asked for anything more thank you